my mind often, so I might be driving down the road. Yeah, hallelujah, the Lord of heaven and earth, amen? Well, I want to encourage you today, because we're going to be looking at a story, uh, again, in the scriptures about Noah, and the topic today is called Noah, the man who built the ark, and I did have in Genesis 7, but really, uh, it's more than that, it's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and it goes on. Uh, even to today when we think about what God was doing there. But let me ask you a question. Actually, I'm going to ask you three questions. Have you ever wondered how people were saved or inherited eternal life before Jesus? I have. I've been asked that question many times. How about this? This I thought about this uh, this week. How do we know we have the story of creation, Adam and Eve, and uh, Cain and Abel, when the whole world was destroyed after that. Hmm. How do we know we got those stories correct? How about this one? Have you ever, like me, wondered and prayed once or many times for God to reveal his will to you? Or his will for you at a particular time in your life? As a university student, I remember we asked a lot of that. You know, young Christian people saying, well, what's God's will for my life? We're pursuing a particular, uh, you know, study or subject, thinking we're going to become somebody in industry or something like that. And, well, maybe God has a different purpose for me. Well, today we will answer these questions in the sermon titled Noah, the man who built the ark. And what's exciting is I look at this and we sang a song today. It said, praise to the Lord who will prosper your work and defend you. Surely his goodness and mercy shall daily attend you. But then listen, ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriends you. And that's what we see with Noah. And that's what's offered to each one of us is for God, the Almighty, to do whatever he wants to do and his love befriends you and me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace. And we thank you for the faithfulness of Noah. We ask that you open up your scriptures to us now. Open up our hearts, our minds, and our wills. To then apply what you speak to us. We ask that you help us to identify with Noah in his journey of faith. That you reveal to each one of us the next step to your will in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. It's rather a unique passage to start with. Acts chapter 18, verse 22. And what we do is we see the Apostle Paul, or excuse me, the Apostle Peter said in this passage that God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began, and they preached the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. And look with me and be amazed, because I've never really focused on this before in this passage, but in verse 18 of Acts chapter 3, the Bible says this, and this is where Peter was speaking to the Jewish people at the time, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he, meaning Jesus, thus fulfilled. So Jesus already fulfilled what all of the prophets have been saying. Verse 19, repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. Whom heaven must receive, heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God had spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will rise up or raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Are you getting this? All the prophets 
since the, time, since the beginning of creation, since the beginning, as it said here, has been preaching this. So according to the scripture, God had prophets since the world began. And what that means is Adam was God's first prophet. Because he was the only one there when the world began. And he would proclaim the gospel of the grace of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Genesis 3.21, Adam and Eve experienced the grace of God in the Garden of Eden. How? When God shed the blood of innocent animals to cover their nakedness. And in verse 15 of Genesis 3, God promised them that the seed of the woman, which is the virgin-born God-man, a biological miracle, just by the seed of the woman, not <laughs> also the man, just the seed of the woman, and this is Jesus Christ. And the promise was that the seed of the woman would crush the head of Satan and provide salvation by grace through faith for all believers. It's interesting. It's a very visual. If you've ever seen uh, The Passion by Mel Gibson, it starts out with a snake. And then all of a sudden, and there's a picture just there. And you see this foot come down on the head of a snake. Referring to that passage. Now we know that the people who lived before the flood had the grace of God preached to them from Adam to Noah. It's always been about grace. And so today I want to talk to you about there are three ways in which God revealed to Noah the gospel of the grace of God and his will for Noah's life. And number one is by word of mouth. Now we know God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. As it says in the text. And God continues to speak to the lost by word of mouth. That's person to person. Now by word of mouth, person to person is and has always been the most effective way to take the gospel message, the gospel of grace of God to a lost world. In Romans 10, a familiar passage, if you have that, Romans 10, 13 to 17, the apostle Paul wrote this. And I'll read it to you. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise. In verse 14, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching, without someone telling them? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. See, it is very evident that Adam preached the gospel to his descendants. This is what's amazing. Adam preached the gospel to his descendants. Now turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. And keep your finger there because we'll flip through a number of verses. And these are rather quite long, so that's another reason I didn't put them on PowerPoint. But Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Let's consider Cain and Abel. And this is what it says in verse 1 of chapter 4 of Genesis. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve. And she became pregnant. And when she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. Everything's okay right there, right? Two different occupations. All right. But in verse 3, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected or rejected. Notice Cain and Abel, both at the same time, to the same place, came at the same time to the same place for the same purpose. To worship God, to present an offering to the Lord. Who taught them to worship God? It was Adam, God's first preacher. God's first prophet. 
Now look at verse 25 to 26 in Genesis 4. Adam had sexual relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to another son. She named him Seth, for she said, God has granted me another son in place of Abel, whom Cain killed. When Seth grew up, he had a son and named him Enosh. At that time, people first began to worship the Lord by name. Who taught Seth and Enosh to worship the Lord by name? God's first prophet, who was Adam. See, Noah could have received God's word. This is interesting. When you think, how did all of this, how did all this, you know, all this uh, first scriptures <laughs> happen, all of this that Adam was doing and the life that was happening before Noah, how did all of that come to today when the whole world was destroyed? Well, Noah could have received God's word from Methuselah, who could have been taught by Adam directly. When Adam dies, Methuselah was 253 years old. How do you all feel about that? Some of you getting on your 80, 70, 80, 90, you're like, oh man, I'm hurting. 253 years old. See, this means that Adam, God's first, pro first prophet, had 253 years in which to indoctrinate Methuselah. Tell him the stories of creation. And Adam and Eve. And the process by which, actually before Eve, even Eve, the process by which he named the animals. Eve being tempted by the serpent and him being with her. God calling him out from hiding to be restored to the fellowship with the Lord. Adam could have said all of this. This is what happened. And then we hid. And then God called me out. And he's like, Adam, where are you? I'm hiding. And I gave these excuses. He could have shared the story about his son murdering his brother. And everything else about their heritage. You know, sometimes when I begin to bestow my great words of wisdom on my kids particularly, I'll start a story and then they'll often say, yeah, 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 dad, we know that. I said, all right, then what happens? And then they usually give me the story. And then I might say, well, yeah, but you didn't. And then I'll add some more to it. You know what I mean? So it would have been something consistent. Telling the story, as you do with your family. You tell stories about your grandfather, your grandmother, your uncle, your aunt, what happened when and where, all of these kind of things. Methuselah, and we move on. Methuselah was Noah's grandfather. And he lived 600 years after Noah was born. So Methuselah has 600 years in which to teach or indoctrinate, indoctrinate Noah his grandson, by word of mouth, the stories of creation, Adam and Eve, and everything else that we know in the first few chapters of the Bible, or excuse me, first five books of the Bible. Now, could there have been others who taught Noah how to know and walk with God? Well, yes, of course. Enoch was Noah's great-grandfather, and he was Methuselah's father. And he walked with God, and God took him. He was translated to heaven. He didn't die. About four years before Noah's birth. So imagine you're Methuselah. And your dad is Enoch. And he walks with God. And then one day, your father... He disappears. God just takes him. Now there's probably some tra maybe something traumatic there. You know. But if you know your father walks with God and you're walking with God, you're displaying all of this. You're teaching all of this information to your grandson, Noah. And I'm going to tell you about my dad. He walked with God and God took him. Really, Grandpa? You know what I mean? These are real people with real stories. And they're sharing stories just like we share. Well, how about this? E even though Enoch passed away four years, or was translated, excuse me, translated four years before Noah's birth, 
Noah's father, Lamech, lived until five years before the flood. So he also had his father. And he died five years before the flood. So Noah's grandfather, Methuselah, the oldest man ever to live upon the earth, died the very year the flood came, which is very interesting. Being 969 years old, Genesis chapter 5, verse 27. Now we think this is far out, but way back when it wasn't. And we can discuss that another time, like why so? Or you read those creation magazines, they'll answer that. And so I did a little research, and this is what I come up with, and I wanted to share it with you. Adam, at the age of 874, oh, that's rather small, 874, Adam knew Lamech, Noah's dad, for 56 years. So Noah's father knew Adam for the first 56 years of his life. Do you think Noah's father would have said, let me tell you about Adam. Let me tell you about how God created the world. Let me tell you everything that we know during that time before the flood. And this was his Lamech, the ninth descent from Adam was born. Having realized that the cause of mankind's pain and sorrow was the man's fall and God's judgment. So you know, Lamech is, is Adam is sharing, man, this is what happened. Man, you, should, you couldn't believe it, what it was like. And then we chose to disobey, and this is what happened. Oh, it was awful. And Lamech felt that, and he understood it. And there was pain and sorrow was the man's fall and God's judgment. And Lamech hoped that it would all be reserved or resolved through his son Noah. That's why Lamech learned the history of the Garden of Eden as he lived contemporaneous, contemporaneously. We'll say it that way. With Adam for 56 years. And thus he named his son Noah. Which means comforter. One who gives peace. With the hope that man's state of sorrow would quickly come to an end. And the garden of Eden be restored. So Lamech, Lamech knew. Listened to the story of Adam. Felt the grief. Felt the pain. Knew the story. Saw what was happening in the world. And he had a son. And he said Noah. Believing that through Noah God would restore And make the world better. Adam at the age of 687. He saw the birth. Of Methuselah. A sign of judgment. And see Methuselah. The eighth descent from Adam was born. His name means. When he dies judgment. I didn't know that. Methuselah means when he dies, judgment. In accordance with his name, the flood came in the year that Methuselah died at the age of 969. 1,656 years after Adam. He died and the flood came. Just as his name says. For 243 years, Adam taught the history of the Garden of Eden to Methuselah, who was a firm witness to the early half of the redemptive history up until the flood. So it is logical to believe that Noah's information about the Lord and everything pre-flood that Noah could have been taught directly by only one person from Adam. Methuselah. Noah, I will tell you exactly what happened because I've known the one who it, whom it happened to for over 200 years. Even more exciting is Noah was instructed in the ways of the Lord our God by at least two people who personally knew Adam, and that including his father, Lamech. Mary and Lamech knew him too. So by word of mouth, Adam would have taught Methuselah and Lamech, and they would have taught Noah so well that the result was what? In Genesis 6, 8, and 9, this is what the Bible says, Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord, the eternal I am, just like his his great-grandfather. And these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So there are three ways in which God revealed to Noah the gospel of the grace 
of his will for Noah's life. And the first one is the word of mouth. The second is by written records. So who is to say, let me ask you this. Who is to say that Noah, who descended from Adam through Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech, was not heir to all the records from Adam to Lamech? In Jude 14 and 15, we just did Jude a couple months ago, and I didn't catch this then, but Jude tells us that Enoch prophesied saying, Behold, this is Enoch. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all. Does that sound familiar? Do we think, oh, isn't that a New Testament teaching? No, that's something way back when. This prophecy was written in the days of Enoch, who was born 622 years after the creation of Adam. And what does he say? Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all. So they know something and they've been preaching it. When God created Adam, Adam was perfect in every way. Spirit, soul, and body. This means that Adam, though never having learned. Like he didn't come in as being born as, I don't know, anything. Goo goo ga ga. He's not a baby. He's a man. He's a man and, he, and God has given him information to begin <laughs> as the ruler of the, of the world to do what he needs to do. He had perfect knowledge of all things related to the creation. And how do we know this? Well, Genesis 2, 18 to 20. If you have that, Genesis 2, 18 to 20. Listen to what God's word says. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam, get ready, to see what he would call them. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Adam was who gave each of the living creatures their names. So Adam did not memorize their names. He named them. So Adam was created with a language, with a vocabulary to express his every thought. Therefore, it does not take a great faith to believe that Adam could have invented an alphabet of letters or of other characters which his spoken language could be written. Or God could have given him the alphabet and letters or characters when he created him. Maybe it was already there. He just started writing it. He already knew it. Or he says, you know, I think I better write this down. <laughs> you know, and created something. And how would everyone who lived before the flood know with accuracy all the names unless they had a system from keeping written records? What about those who didn't even know Adam? And all of a sudden, oh, what's that? Well, well that's a giraffe. I know because that's Adam. Well, what about the other people? Hey, what's that? We call him tall neck, you know, or something else. Obviously, there was a knowledge of what those animals were called. See, Noah must have had some of the written records from Adam to Lamech that taught him about God and what we know about everything prior to the flood. Must have been written records. We do that. You know, as a second year university student with power to change, uh, Randy was discipling John, and John was discipling me, and I was discipling my friend Viet, all in the same year. What John was teaching me this week, I would write in my study book. He didn't think I was ready to teach, but the guys asked me to, so I said, yeah, okay, I'll lead the Bible study. And, <laughs> you know, and I would be there with John, I think, on a Tuesday or Wednesday, and he's asking me these questions, and I'm going to first point, second point. Ooh, that's a good question. And then I would spend time that week thinking, how would I teach it? And usually ask the same questions he did. And then I would share it with Viet and the other four or five others in that group the next week. So all of us were learning the same information and growing in understanding of God's ways all in the same year. 
You know, and I praise the Lord, praise the Lord because like Noah, Randy, John, Matthew, and Viet found the gospel of the grace in Jesus just as the Apostle Peter said we would. And we were learning how to walk with God and begin to understand how to know the will of God for our lives. So there are three ways in which God revealed to Noah the gospel of the grace of God and his will for Noah's life. Number one was the word of mouth. Number two, by written records. And by number three is revelation. See, God revealed his will to Noah. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 to 14. This is how God revealed his will to Noah, by revelation. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark. And in verse 22, it says, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Isn't that wonderful? God says, hey, listen, man. I'm going to destroy this place. Make yourself an ark. And then he gives them all the, the details of how to do it. How to be as successful at it. And Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. You know, it was not until Noah was faithful in obeying God and building the ark according to God's specific commands. See, he didn't say, build an ark. Okay, let me see. How do I want to do this? <sighs> And he didn't come up with a plan. God said, hey, I want you to do this. Build yourself an ark. And this is how you're going to build it. He said, okay. And he built it just like that. But it wasn't until Noah was faithful in, in building this ark, just as God commanded him, did God speak to him again and share the next step of God's will in Noah's life. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Noah. So after he built it. After he built it. Then the Lord said. Go into the ark. You and all your household. For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And take with you. And then he gives a whole bunch of more instructions. Aren't you glad God in his wisdom does not tell you. Or reveal to you the whole picture of his will for your life all at once. Yeah. I think we'd all give up. <laughs> ah, no. I'm not in. <laughs> Forget it. What? You know what I mean? And then we get lost in all the details. And we get afraid. And all this. And think about all the prayers you wouldn't pray. And all the, the prayers you would miss seeing revealed. And all the things that allowed you in your journey... To identify with others. Or to be more teachable because they know something that you're about to go through. Think about all the relationships that would not be if God just said, here it is. After one year at sea, in this ark. It said that the flood ended and the land was dry. One year in this ark. One year with his family. Talking about getting claustrophobic maybe, you know what I mean? Okay, too much time. You know? I got a large family and we've been in people movers. <laughs> After a while, you got to do rest stops. Well, there's no rest stop for one year floating on the, you know, in the ocean. Imagine this whole experience that they had to go through. Not knowing when they would get off. After one year at sea in this ark with a family and all these living creatures, Genesis 8.15 says this, Then God said to Noah, All right, you built the ark, and you did all that I commanded. Now get in the ark and bring your family and this and that and all these other creatures, and I'll bring them to you. Boom! Now shut it up. And then all of a sudden the waters recede and there's dry land. And then God said to Noah, go out from the ark. To know God's will for your life always starts with you experiencing his grace. Coming, that means coming to faith in Jesus as your savior. 
than committing to walking with God. Learning to listen to His voice. Then obeying everything He tells you to do. And when you complete what God has commanded you to do, then God reveals the next part of His will for your life. This is the way it has always been from the beginning. And will always be. However, in the past 6,000 years, God has spoken to men and women through dreams or a voice from heaven. He often revealed himself to man in the form of a man or as the angel of the Lord. We're not told how he spoke to Noah. All we know is that he revealed his will for Noah's life one step at a time. How did he know all that about God, well, word to word, you know, it was written, revelation. And what's amazing is that all we know is that he revealed his will for Noah's life one step at a time. And Noah obeyed all of God's commands one step at a time. See, God, knowing that Noah and his family would be the only survivors of the flood entrusted Noah with the knowledge of all of his acts from creation to the flood. And in so doing, Noah was able to pass these truths on to his descendants, down to Moses, who then wrote under the inspiration of God the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And we have it with us today to help us and everyone we can share with by word of mouth or as a written record. To know who God is. We have God's word to know. We have a written record so that we can learn. That it helps us to know who God is. How he gives and communicates his grace. And how he calls his children to follow him into his purpose for the people. In their sphere of influence and beyond for his glory. You know, we can praise the Lord. Noah chose to walk with God and God expressed his grace to Noah and his family. And through them, we are part of the billions of people. If you've put your faith in Christ Jesus, you are part of the billions of people over time who have found favor in God's eyes and have become a recipient of his grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And thus, you have become a child of God forever. And you and I, have a wonderful, courageous, exciting part in God's purpose and plans for this world and the next. He wants to include us. Ponder anew what Almighty God can do when He befriends you. When you start to walk with Him. When you're walking with God, who's leading? He's the leader. He has to be the leader. There's no way that God's going to be walking with you and you decide to go this way that he's going to go that way. He knows where he's going. And he's saying, you can walk with me. And this is what I do. By nature, I am an almighty God. And I do almighty things in people's lives and in this world. And you can be a part of it. Do you want to come? Do you want to come? Let's go together. Let's walk. You know, at times you may feel like you're walking alone. Sometimes you've walked with God just one-on-one -on -one and it's been the most wonderful experience. He said, I don't know what's going on in my world. It's just, I'm just so glad it's you and me. It's just you and me. I feel so loved. I feel so cared for. This is just wonderful. You know, I was thinking about Noah. Think about living, you know, we, we kind of struggle and sometimes whinge about our culture. A lot of people who don't like what we like. And are against what we believe. But imagine if you were Noah. And his wife. And his sons. And, and their wives. Everyone. On the whole face of the earth. Are wicked to the core. And it's only you. And a few other people in your family. That are walking with God. 
I mean, everyone is wicked. And then God tells you to do something that is, what did you say, astronomical. <laughs> it's just massive. And you've got to come up with it. You're the first one through. And then he tells you to get on a boat. And then this big, massive, you know, we got floods over there. Well, imagine, and, you know, we can pray and be sympathetic. You know, over east, there's these big floods. But brothers and sisters, what if there's not only big floods? What if there's earthquakes? Tsunamis. Hurricanes. All of it. That's tense. Noah and his family was about a flood that destroyed everything. And they had to be in a boat, even though it's large, and compare, it's a teeny little dot in the ocean. That's the journey that Noah went through. And God saw him through it. So if God can do that with Noah, he can do that with each one of us, whatever happening, either it be difficulties in the family, difficulties with health, difficulties at job, difficulties at school, difficulties anywhere. God can see you through it. He says, walk with me. I'm not rattled. And sometimes I cause that for you to cling to me. I did this so that you would cling to me. And sometimes, yep, just like footprints, I'm going to pick you up. And I'm going to carry you through. Noah and his family were real people. And you and I have a wonderful, courageous, exciting part in God's purpose and plans for this world and the next. What we're doing here will be translated into heaven. It's a responsibility, it's a privilege to enjoy the favor of God in our obedience to everything God commands for you, for me, and for us, for our descendants, and for generations to come. That's what God's thinking about. It's not just today. It's just not you and you. It's generations. Generations to come. Noah was just a man, or it's not just a man who built the ark. In God's eyes, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, a human being who walked with God. Do you want to be such a person in God's eyes? Then what is God commanding you to do today? 